Hey friends, how you doing? I'm Steve, welcome to my channel. Today we're gonna to talk about the tragic life of one of the most tortured souls in rock and roll. Through his angst-fueled songwriting and his anti-establishment persona, his songs literally created a brand new genre of rock. He's viewed as the face of Generation X, and he's considered one of the most influential, if not the most influential, alternative rock musicians. Today we're gonna to talk about Kurt Cobain. So who was Kurt Cobain? Well, he was born February 20th, 1967 in Aberdeen, Washington. His mother, Wendy Elizabeth, was a waitress and his father, Donald Cobain, was an auto mechanic. He has one younger sister named Kimberly. Music was in his blood right from the start. His uncle, Chuck Friedenberg, played in a band called the Beachcombers. His aunt, Mary Earl, played in several bands throughout the Grays Harbor area. Now, Grays Harbor is where Aberdeen is located. It's about 100, 100 so miles southwest of Seattle. His great uncle Dilbert performed as an Irish tenor and appeared in the 1930s movie called The King of Jazz. And his grandmother, Iris Cobain, she was a professional artist. So he was raised in a very artistic family. Now, Kurt was a happy kid, a bit hyperactive, but very caring and sensitive. He showed artistic talent at a very early age with drawings he did of his favorite cartoon characters and actors. And his grandmother encouraged this. According to his Aunt Mary, he began to show signs of musical talent at a very early age. He started singing at the tender age of two. He was writing his own songs and playing piano and singing at four. He loved the band ELO. Now that's the Electric Light Orchestra Band. And he sang their songs all the time. Now, if you don't know who that is, they were very big in the 70s. when They had hits like uh, Evil Woman and Mr. Blue Sky. Check them out. Pretty cool band. Now, he'd also sing Arlo Guthrie's motorcycle song, Hey Jude by the Beatles, and a bunch of other songs like that. He just loved music. His parents divorced when he was nine years old, and when that happened, it was a huge impact on his life. His mother said his personality changed, and he became very defiant and withdrawn, and he started to show signs of depression. Kurt said in a 1993 interview that he felt ashamed of his parents as a kid. He desperately wanted the, the typical nuclear family that would give him a sense of security, but he wasn't getting that from his parents and he resented him for it. He resented him for years. His parents had promised they wouldn't find new partners, but they did. And when they did, he became even more depressed and withdrawn. His new stepmom and her two kids, Mindy and James moved in with his dad and he really liked her quite a bit until she had a baby. Well, that baby's name was Chad Cobain, by the way. And of course she started paying attention to the little one. She has to. Well, he felt that was taking the attention away from him, and he resented her for it. At the same time, his mother had entered into an abusive relationship with a, a man, and, and he was awful to her. He'd beat her so bad a couple times that she was hospitalized. Now, Kurt saw everything. He begged her to leave him, but she just refused. His dad and stepmom took him to a therapist who determined it would be a lot better for him in a single family environment. Now his parents, they just couldn't reconcile. So his mom gave full custody to his dad in 1979. Kurt's interests were all musical or art related, but his father wanted him to play sports. Kurt didn't want to at all. His dad made him wrestle in junior high and he was actually pretty good at it, uh, but he didn't like the whole macho jock thing. So he would, intentionally let himself get pinned so maybe his dad wouldn't make him do it but this caused him to draw ridicule from his teammates and his coach now after this his dad made him play little league baseball and he would deliberately strike out he just didn't want to play and he was hoping he was hoping it hurt his dad and his dad would just stop pushing him on it when he was around 13 years old he started smoking pot and that was when he started exploring substances on his 14th birthday in 1981, his uncle offered him a new bicycle or a guitar. Kurt jumped on the guitar. He started learning songs and he was spending all his time doing that. And his dad hated it. And so he started pushing him even harder to do more sports. Well, his uncle had gotten him lessons with one of the other musicians from the Beachcombers band. And that had fueled Kurt's passion for music even more, which ticked his dad off even more. And his dad made him quit the lessons. While he was in school, he befriended a gay student and they became great friends and he valued that friendship quite a bit. But because of this friendship, he was getting bullied by some of the local kids and they were beating him up. This experience sparked 
a lot of anger and hatred towards bigotry. And it sparked his outspoken support for the LGBTQ community. He said he grew to despise the, quote, redneck culture of that small logging community. And he took joy into doing things that would provoke him. Now, he got arrested in 85 for vandalizing pickup trucks in Aberdeen uh, by spray painting the phrase, God is gay on them. He got arrested in 86 for tagging banks with the phrase, ain't got no how whatchamacallit. I have no idea what that means. And he was also arrested for trespassing in abandoned buildings while he was drunk. Now, everything Kurt was experiencing was leaving emotional scars, and he was struggling to overcome them, but he couldn't. So he started self-medicating to cope with them. And in turn, he was continuing to become more withdrawn and more antisocial. All of the anger he was feeling started building and building, and it turned him into a bit of a bully himself. He started bullying some kids at school. He was suffering from great depression, and he said that during this time, he started to experience a lot of bad stomach pains. Kurt's teenage rebellion was too much for his dad. It, he was just getting too much to handle, and his dad just didn't know what to do with him. So he would leave him with family and friends quite a bit, and at one point, Kurt was completely homeless. For a while, he lived with the family of his friend, Jesse Reed, whose father was the saxophonist in the Beachcombers band. Now, his dad had all this musical equipment, and he would let Kurt play with it anytime he wanted. So he and Jesse would spend their 45s, and for you younger people who don't know what a 45 is, it's a small vinyl record. And then they would play music and write songs together. And he enjoyed this time quite a bit. Jesse came from a devout Christian family and they went to church regularly. So Kurt started going to church with them and he got involved in the church. He soon became born again and he was enjoying the feeling of belonging someplace and he was belonging at the church, but that was short lived. He started renouncing his face and spewing a bunch of anti-God rants. At the same time, he's exploring other religions. He was trying to find somewhere to fit in. Now, side note, the song lithium was actually about the time he was living with Jesse's family. And while in school, Kurt would draw often in class. And a lot of times he'd be drawing parts of the human anatomy that weren't appropriate for school. Now, he would draw criticism from his teachers on his art assignments. For example, he drew a picture of Michael Jackson that the teacher said was inappropriate for the hallway. I have no idea what he drew. Anyway, it was through these art classes that he met and befriended Roger Buzz Osborne, he was the singer and guitarist for the band, the Melvins, uh, which was a local punk rock band. And he introduced Kurt to punk. Now they became fast friends and Kurt spent all his time with him. He would work as a roadie for the Melvins during the performances, hang out during their rehearsals. And he just wanted to be around them as much as possible. Now there's some contention over what was Kurt's first concert. Many of his classmates and family members say that his first concert was Sammy Hagar and quarter flash in 1983. However, Kurt maintained his first concert was seeing the Melvins when they played a free concert at the Thriftway store where Roger worked. I would probably bet that that one's more accurate. Now, Thriftway, if you don't know, was a grocery store chain in the Pacific Northwest. Kurt wrote about his uh, experiences in his journals, and in several interviews, he said he found his escape from home life in the Seattle punk rock scene, and it had a huge impact on him. This is also where Kurt met Chris Novoselic, who later became the basis for Nirvana. He moved in with his mom his second year of high school, and he stayed there until two weeks before he was supposed to graduate when he found out he didn't have enough credits. Well, he just dropped out, and his mom said, no, I'm going to give you an ultimatum. Get a job or get out of the house. Well, a week later, he came home to find all his stuff in boxes on the front yard. She threw him out. Now, he was pretty dejected because of this, and who wouldn't be? He felt like everyone who was important to him and who he was supposed to be important to just cast him aside. So during this time, he stayed with some friends, and sometimes he would sneak back into his mom's house into the basement, stay there without her knowing it. But most of the time, he was, he was homeless. Now, Kurt said during this time, he lived under the Young Street Bridge that went over the Wishka River, which inspired the song Something in the Way, by the way. Uh, however, Chris said, nah, no way, didn't happen. He said he hung out down there, but the muddy banks and the tide coming in and out, no way anybody could live down there. He said that was Kurt's own, quote, revisionism. Now, Kurt 
he would get himself a few odd jobs to support himself. And for a short time, he worked as a janitor at his old high school. But this didn't work out for him much for the same reason why he struggled going to school in the first place. In 1992, Kurt talked about the Aberdeen area. And in, in an interview, he said, quote, it's a really small place with a lot of people with really small minds. Basically, if you're not prepared to join the logging community, you're going to be beaten up or run out of town. That's how he felt about his hometown. He just didn't fit in. Kurt formed several joke bands with some of the members from Melvin's. In 1985, he formed a band called Fecal Matter, and they made a demo tape featuring Kurt playing guitar and singing and Del Crover of the Melvin's playing bass and drums. Didn't go anywhere. Now, that band broke up in 86. At that time, Kurt moved from Aberdeen to Olympia, Washington. He was struggling to find anyone to play with, and he would play with Chris from time to time. And he kept begging him to start a band, but Chris just wasn't into it. Well, he kept begging him for months. And after a period of time, Chris finally, finally gave in and they started a band. They auditioned a bunch of drummers, but they couldn't find the right person. They played gigs to small crowds, very small crowds, and they were having a real hard time gaining any traction. So they did a demo with a guy named Jack and Dino. He was the producer and engineer who was responsible for Soundgarden's first recordings. And they got Dale Crover to play drums on them. Now these became known as the quote Dale tapes. Jack sent some of these demos out and it did stir some interest, but nothing happened. People were seeing potential, but it just wasn't enough. Now this was also when Kurt started using heroin. Now remember he said he had chronic stomach pain for years. Kurt said that when he used, his stomach didn't hurt. But according to Buzz Osborne of the Melvins, uh, no, that's not the case. He said it was more likely causing the stomach pains. He said that Kurt was using that as an excuse to keep using. Now, I have no experience with this, but apparently people who use this particular drug will throw up after and they call it vomiting with a smile on your face. Now, Chris said that Kurt was prone to abusing alcohol, mind altering and other dangerous substances just to get messed up. He was self-medicating, trying to deal with his mental struggles. This stuff wasn't helping. But during this time, he said the experiences led him to the perfect band name, Nirvana. Now, Nirvana means a transcendent state in which there's neither suffering, desire, nor sense of self. And the subject is released from the effects of karma and the cycle of death and rebirth. This is exactly what Kurt was trying so unsuccessfully to find. The intent of the band's music was to stand out from the aggressive, angry punk bands that they've been associating with. And they first used the name Nirvana on March 19th, 1988 at the Tacoma, Washington Community World Theater. During this time, Jack and Dino had sent the Dale tapes to two DJs, John Poneman and Bruce Pavitt, who were also with Sub Pop Records. He also sent it to DJ Shirley Carlson of C KCMU Radio in Seattle. She liked the song Floyd the Barber started playing and it got a lot of airplay. Now, John and Bruce came to Nirvana's first Seattle gig, April 10th, 1988, at Central Tavern in Pioneer Square. The crowd was really small, and according to Bruce, there were three people, Bruce, John, and the bartender. He said they did not impress. Their original material was terrible. Everything was bad. However, they did like their rendition of Love Buzz by the 60s Dutch band Shocking Blue. That made a pretty, pretty big impression on them, and it was enough for them to invite Nirvana to play in their showcase. Now, they did a showcase called Sub Pop Sunday, and it was an event at the Vogue Club in Seattle. A lot of the up-and-coming, soon-to-be grunge bands were playing at this place. They showed up. They didn't do very well. They, they were uptight. They were nervous, and it really showed in their playing. Kurt said he felt like he was being judged. They were, especially since they had songs on the radio, and there was a buzz going on around them. They, they really felt the pressure, and they didn't respond to it well. But it must not have mattered much because the sub pop execs saw something they liked. They signed Nirvana to a record deal and they were written about and praised in Backlash magazine. The DJ started pushing their single Love Buzz really hard on the radio. And it was doing so well that sub pop offered them an extended contract. On June 15th, 1989, they released their first album, Bleach, 
with Jack and Dino as their producer. This album just sold 40,000 units and it did not chart. Now in September of 89, they worked with another producer, Steve Fisk. He was known for working with the band Screaming Trees and they recorded the EP Blue. They toured for about six months across America and then another six weeks in England. Around this time, Kurt had started a relationship with a girl named Tracy Marauder, and he moved in with her. Now, she was a waitress at the cafeteria in the Boeing plant in Seattle. Now, Boeing is an airplane manufacturer, if you don't know who they are. Now, she would steal food from work. She'd bring it home for them to eat. When Kurt wasn't touring, he would spend his time watching TV, sleeping late, or doing art projects, and he was doing a ton of mind-altering substances. She kept pushing him to get a job, and because they weren't surviving on what she was making, this resulted in a bunch of arguments, and they ultimately broke up. Now, side note, Tracy is not only credited with taking the cover and back photos for the Bleach album, she's also the inspiration for the song About a Girl, and she didn't find out about that until after Kurt passed. After this, he started dating a girl named Toby Vale, who was an influential member of the Riot Girl movement. Now, this movement focused on feminism and the problems of sexism in the punk rock scene in the Seattle area. This relationship was really hard on him. Now, he said when he first met her, he puked because he was so overwhelmed by anxiety because of the infatuation he felt for her. Now, that inspired the line, love you so much it makes me sick, in the song Aneurysm. He thought of her as a female counterpart, and they recorded some music together in a project called The Bathtub is Real. But their time together wasn't satisfying. He was looking for that maternal comfort that might come from a traditional re- relationship, and, and Toby felt that that kind of thing was completely sexist. She did have a profound effect on him, and she inspired him to write a lot of songs. Now, during the Bleach album and the tour subsequently that followed, they used a drummer named Chad Channing. They toured the UK and did some shows across America. They started recording a new album in April of 1990, this time at Smart Studios in Madison, Wisconsin. Kurt had become very disenchanted with Chad's playing, and and it resulted in a conflict and Chad split. Now, they were back to needing a drummer, didn't have one in mind, so they got Dale Crover to fill in again on the concerts they still had slated until they finally found and hired David Grohl. They signed with Geffen Records in the spring of 1991, and they recorded their first album with them, Nevermind, which was released on September 24th of 91. This album included the song Smells Like Teen Spirit, which broke them out in the mainstream and started the subgenre of rock we now know as grunge. They were an instant success, and they paved the way for other grunge artists to come out, like uh, Alice in Chains, Soundgarden, and Pearl Jam. This album is highly regarded as a 90s masterpiece. Come As You Are was the second explosive radio hit, and they embarked on a European tour not long after that. In 1992, they were featured in a, a movie called 1991, The Year Punk Broke, and this sparked a bunch more interest in the band. This is also when the band, in true punk fashion, started taking stances on different political views. They played anti-war benefits. They spoke out against the anti-gay measures that were going on in Oregon. And they spoke out against the erotic music law that was being presented in Washington. They donated concert proceeds to rape relief uh, for the war-ravaged Bosnia. And... Uh, contributed a song for the fundraising CD for the anti-violence organization Home Alive. Kurt began being very vocal on these and other, quote, controversial subjects, leading him to receive several death threats, including one threatening to shoot him as soon as he stepped on the stage. With the depression that Kurt has been dealing with for so many years, these types of attacks and threats weren't helping his psyche. They were getting to him. Now, They released their second album, Incesticide, and this drew a lot of attention from the fans because of Kurt's open and honest display of his feelings. In the liner notes, he expressed his disdain for racism, homophobic thoughts and statements, sexism, and rape. In 1993, they worked with producer Steve Albini to cut all apologies in Heart Shaped Box. 
These were included on In Utro, their final album, which reached number one on the Billboard charts. It was a commercial success, but that didn't sit well with Kurt. He said he felt it was very impersonal. And even though many of the songs dealt with things he was dealing with in his personal life, people were missing the point. The band went through several disputes over production and mixing of the album, specifically with Albini. And Kurt wasn't happy with the results. He forced them to go through several different producers trying to find what he wanted. And it wasn't working. Kurt wanted what he wanted. And until they found a producer that would do it his way, he wasn't going to be satisfied. Now, on top of this, he was also getting a lot of grief from the media. So with all of this stuff happening, he just wasn't a happy person. Somewhere between 89 and 1991, he met Courtney Love. There's some disagreement about how they met. One version says in 1989, they met when Nirvana opened for the Dharma Bums at the Satyricon Club in Portland, Oregon. Another says that they met a year later at a different show, but the same club. And yet another one says they didn't meet until 1991 at an L7 Butthole Surfer concert in L.A. Whichever one is right, Courtney started chasing Kurt immediately. He was being very evasive because he wasn't sure he wanted to be in a relationship, but eventually he started spending more time with her and they bonded through their substance abuse as she partook of the same things he did. In February of 1992, Kurt and Courtney were married in Waikiki Beach, Hawaii, and there was a total of eight people in attendance, including Dave Grohl. Now, Courtney said that she was warned by Kim Gordon, the basis of Sonic Youth, that marrying Kurt would destroy her. But she said, I don't care. I love him. I want to be with him. Now, Courtney was already pregnant with their daughter, Frances Bean, and she was born in August of that year. Incidentally, they included a sonogram of the baby in the artwork for the single Lithium. Now, there's a little bit more controversy here. Courtney admitted in 1992 in an article in Vanity Fair that she would drug binge with Kurt early on in the pregnancy. However, she later said that she was misquoted and that she only used prior to finding out she was pregnant. This also raised questions as if Francis was born addicted to drugs at birth. Now, the L.A. Children's Services took them to court suing them, saying they were unfit parents due to drug use. This added to the struggles that Kurt was already having mentally. I mean, someone's trying to take your kid. That's, that's tough. November of 1993, Nirvana was on MTV Unplugged, which aired in December. They released a recording of all the mellow versions of the songs they played on the show, and it received a Grammy for the best alternative album. Grunge was taken over the airwaves thanks to Nirvana, and they became the flagship for Generation X. Kurt had become a spokesperson for a generation unintentionally, something he neither wanted nor was ready for. He felt everyone was missing the point of his artistic message and seemingly turned into exactly what he was singing against. The massive success of what they achieved went against his roots and vision, and he felt probed and prodded at every turn. He began to resent the people who claimed to be his fans because they weren't properly acknowledging or interpreting the band's social or political views. On March 1st, 1994, Nirvana was on a tour stop in Munich, Germany, and Kurt was diagnosed with both bronchitis and severe laryngitis. He flew to Rome the next day for treatment and was joined by Courtney on March 3rd. Now on the 4th, uh, in the morning, Courtney woke up and found Kurt had taken, she said, 50 sleeping pills and drank champagne, a lot of champagne. She called the police and he was taken to the hospital in a coma. They put this down as an accident, but it was believed to be a failed night attempt. When he was released, he returned to Seattle and on March 18th, 1994, Courtney called the police again, reporting that Kurt was trying to hurt himself and had locked himself into a room with a firearm. The police arrived, confiscated several firearms and a bottle of pills that Kurt had. Kurt insisted that he wasn't trying to hurt himself. He had locked himself in the room to protect himself from his wife. Courtney arranged an intervention on March 25th with 10 people to come in to be in attendance. And that included record execs, musician friends, uh, and Dylan Carlson, who was one of cl Kurt's closest friends from high school. Kurt reacted to this in anger. He lashed out at everyone who was there. He locked himself in the upstairs bedroom, uh, refusing to come out. But by the end of the night, he agreed to go to rehab. Now, I'll point out 
that Courtney was a user as well. And from personal experience, when you have one person who has um, an addiction and the other person who has addiction in the same house will not try to stop, it's very difficult for the first person to stop. So I imagine he was in a really hard spot if he really wanted to quit. On March 30th, 1994, Kurt checked into the rehab center in LA, but he only stayed for a day. He escaped by scaling a six foot wall. He caught a flight back to Seattle and on the flight, he happened to sit next to Duff McKagan of Guns N' Roses. Now this was a band he despised, but Duff said it was really odd because Kurt actually seemed very happy to see him and they talked the entire flight. Later, Duff said, looking back, the whole situation was off and he should have listened to his instincts because he knew something was wrong. No one had heard or seen from Kurt you know, since the flight. And on April 7th, the band pulled out of the Lollapalooza festival that they were supposed to headline. There were rumors flying around that Nirvana was breaking up. On April 8th at 9.40 a.m., Seattle's KXRX radio announced that an unnamed local rock star had been found dead in his home. It was soon revealed that Kurt had been found in the garage behind his home by an electrician who was there to install a security system. He had apparently ended his own life. A note was found in a nearby flower pot with a pen stuck through it, and it was addressed to his imaginary childhood friend, Buddha. In the letter, he said that he had not felt the excitement of playing music or writing music in a very long time. When he was found, it was determined that he had been gone for a few days, estimating um, that his time of death was around April 5th. He was only 27 years old. This news sent shockwaves through the music community. Radio stations, MTV, and other media just went all Nirvana all the time. Musicians in the Seattle area took the loss hard, and the landscape of the music in that city had changed forever. On April 10th, a private service was held for the family, friends, and label staffers. And hours later, a public memorial of approximately 5,000 Nirvana fans gathered near Seattle's Central Flag Pavilion to console each other and remember Kurt. Courtney Love read the letter, and I have to admit, I listened to it. It was sad, disturbing, and I was shocked by it. So when things like this happen, it's not uncommon for people to try to find some way to explain what they can't understand. This is one of them. There have been a bunch of conspiracy theories that have risen over a uh, situation of leading up to and after the fact of what happened to, to Kurt. And there are some very good videos that are a bit graphic and they're very detailed and they go through them. I'm not going to discuss that part here. All I'm going to say is everything that I've watched and listened to, there's no evidence substantiating any foul play was done. It just looks like what, what was reported happened. I will say that from everything I've watched, Kurt was struggling and whether it was because money was stopping the people that were around him from doing anything about it, or he was really good at hiding it from him. I think in hindsight, at least in hindsight, these people know that something was going on and maybe they could have stepped up a little bit more, but you never know. Kurt Cobain is a prime example of being careful what you wish for because you might get it. He was a unique individual. He was poetic, sensitive, intelligent, and he really wanted to stand up and fight for the underdog. He suffered through a rough life, and because of that, he had scars that ran deep. He became a reluctant spokesperson for a generation, and his voice still resonates today, and I'm sure it will as long as his music exists. His success and status was more than he could handle. It wasn't what he wanted, and his spiral happened in a remarkably short time. And it's sad that it happened. If you were someone you know is struggling or going through crisis, please reach out to someone. Let them know that you need help. Text or call 988 to reach a lifeline. Let them know you need help. Reach out to someone. So thanks for joining me on this. I hope you learned something. I hope you found it interesting. If you did, let me know in the comments. If there's someone you like me to check out, let me know in the comments. I'll be happy to do it. Until next time. Music's going to live on forever, so just remember, rock's not dead. Take care.